Emotions Matter. Brought to you by ema.com. That's e m a w w dot com. Your solution for emotional intelligence. Thank you for joining me today, your host Monique, on the Emotions Matter podcast. It is an honor and genuine pleasure for me to introduce my guest, Jonathan Tilly. Jonathan is best known for his TEDx talk, "What Creativity Is Trying to Tell You," that has inspired over thousands of creatives around the world. However, his own career began much earlier, working as a creative himself, as a voiceover artist, director, and choreographer for top industry clients such as Google, Facebook, L'Oreal, Giorgio Armani, and a European production of Mamma Mia, to name a few. He has applied his past experiences as a creative in order to be a personal brand strategist, as he states on his website. He works exclusively with other creatives to help them reach their artistic goals. And now I'd like to welcome my guest, Jonathan Tilly. Hi there, everybody. Hey, thanks for having me. So you are now in、uh, talking to me from from Germany, correct? Yes, I am. Oh, wonderful! This is so exciting when we get to talk to people from all over the world, and and not just you know within the United States. So again, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. You know, you have. An extremely extensive artistic background. Can you share with our listeners how you use your own experiences in your work as a personal brand strategist? Yeah, sure thing.、Um, so, as you probably mentioned in in、uh, in my bio, I have I have this extensive artistic background, and it just sort of happened. With a lot of persistence, a lot of grit, and a lot of training,、um, I went from musical theater, per- performing in all those different shows, to、um, doing voiceover, to doing web design and branding and things like that. So, I think you know you you connect the dots going backwards, right? You can't really see the journey that you're going in. You can just trust your gut and and stay curious and experiment and get training and, and try things out. So. I think all the cumulative things that I've done through my artistic career has brought me to this point. And geez, you know, in ten, twenty years from now, I'm so excited to see to look back and and see where where that brought me as well. So, I use my experiences in my work as a personal brand strategist in in knowing, for example, when I'm doing a, a, a when I'm branding a musical theater performer, yeah, and、um, who is. Performing in、uh, the the lead role of 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 the bodyguard in、um, in the Whitney Houston role,、mm-hmm. <clears throat> we just we just finished doing her her website recently here in Germany, and I just remember being being you know on stage and having all those friends on stage and knowing what what it's really like for her on stage every night eight shows a week, and just any any random old web designer can't be in their shoes, you know. So I I bring to the table. Knowing what it's like to be in their shoes, and also to to be able to help them shine online and share their talent with the world, and and help them have an online presence that presence that makes them feel one hundred percent like themselves. Yeah, you you bring that empathy level. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. So you can, and and you probably even help them dig out some things that they didn't even think about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have a, a a questionnaire where where I just say, you know, just write stream of. Th- I ask them questions in this questionnaire, and I just say, write out your stream of thought, and not everything's going to be used, and it's just for me to get an idea of who you are. And what's fascinating is that people sit down with a cup of tea on a cozy evening and just start writing, and they pour out these beautiful things that they wouldn't usually. Share with with everyone, and I'm not saying that I copy it word for word and slam it online. <laughs> oh man, no, not at all. But what, but what I get is the essence of who that person is, and and even if it's just a word that they that they continually use over and over, that's going to have a major impact on how I filter their persona through my、um, creative process and and create a website for them or create a brand for them. Most definitely. 
what you're also doing for them is giving them a little bit more of a unique presence and edge, um, you know, on on social media and on their websites because it, it's sort of like the form letter, you know, that that you learn when you're in high school. How do you write a letter? to a to a business and everybody has you know dear blank you know blah 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 and a lot of times websites look like that you know it's just sort of exactly. cookie, cookie cutters so you're really yeah. you're really uh, building and crafting this uh, with their unique personality so that when a person reads it they're not reading just anything they're really knowing who the who this person is by the time they get through the website exactly Exactly. Yeah, that's not easy. So good for you, and you taking Thank your you. your past experience to do that. That is that is a critical key in uh, in communicating ideas with somebody who has that kind of knowledge and sensitivity. So that's going to bring me to my next question about your presentation that that you do a lot. I'm sure you're invited to a lot of places to talk about your creativity. Uh, I want to say speech, but it's not really a speech. You're m- much more interactive than just that. And, <laughs> and you define uh, the creative process in that. Mm. Can you kind of just briefly share with our listeners you know, what that process is? Sure thing. Um, so for my TEDx talk, what creativity is trying to tell you, um, I... I approached TEDx and I said, you know, I want to do a talk about creativity. And they said, great. Can you give us a little bit more of a structure? (laughs) And I said, "Um, I'll get back to you. So I (laughs) um, scrounged and, and, and just asked every creative person that I knew. And I even, you know, set up an online survey just for creative people, asking them to describe their creative process. And through that research, I realized that there was a beginning, middle and end. I tried to structure it together into a beginning, middle and end. And the beginning was, um, and, and of course it's very left brained analytical beginning, middle and end. That's not really creative. So let's switch that over to the right brain. So if the beginning were having a thought and being in a sacred space where that creative thought is allowed to be curious, allowed to explore, allowed to, to just take up some space and see where it takes you. You know, there's a difference between I'm, I'm looking out my, my window right now and there's a huge highway that I see every day going, going by my window and the windows that I have are really, really thick. So, you know, when the, when the windows are closed, it's beautiful and peaceful. And if you don't look out the window, you think you're in, in this safe haven and I can write my things out and I can work you know, really focused and, and have a wonderful time. But the moment I open that window, there's cars racing by and I can't even think straight. So the first, the first step to the creative process is allowing yourself to be in a sacred space, in a space that, that you can come to terms with who you are and let your inner artist out and explore. Because if you're not treating yourself to that, there's no way that your inner artist can actually have any kind of sacred space to begin to even culminate any kind of thoughts or, or ideas for, for the creative process. Then the second part, um, the middle is what I call making mistakes or failure. And, you know, I think, I think we all have had this brilliant idea in our sacred spaces, just like in the, in the first, um, in the first part. And then we start working on it and then we come across a little obstacle here or a little stumbling block there or a speed bump there. And we realize that the thing that we are trying to create is telling us through the mistakes and failures, what it is not. (laughs) Yeah. And if we listen close enough, we'll realize, okay, this is what it is not. So maybe if I don't bang my head against the window and maybe open the other window and fly out like a, like a fly just banging, banging its body up against the window without realizing the next window is open. If I just, you know, step back, move away from this mistake or failure and maybe try a different route, where will that take me? With the same curiosity and intention of that original thought that was created, that was inspired to us from the, from our sacred space. And then after a while, there's going to be no more failures and mistakes. You're going to actually have something. Thought will become a thing. And the third part of the creative process, that creativity needs to be shared. And in doing so, we inspire others 
with our creative thing, whatever we have created, to take it into their own creative process, into their own sacred space, and be inspired by our work and have that continue on with their own creative process. So the creative process is cyclical. And this is what I realized um, while doing this research and speaking with friends, um, that the creative process is as individual as it is universal, it's cyclical. And the more that we share our talent with the world, the more creativity we bring into the world, the more we inspire others to be creative as well. That is the truth. Yeah, and that important step of failure, which is something that we hope we avoid, but we yes. can't, and it's and it's part of our growth, and which, which is really what our subject is going to be uh, as we progress here today is that idea mm. of embracing that failure. But before we go there, I'm I'm just curious, what would you say are the feelings? You know, because we are an, an emotional intelligence podcast, <laughs> mm. what kinds of feelings? would you identify as being part of the creative process? Mm, I love talking about feelings. This is awesome. <laughs> Rarely do we get the chance. Um, so this is such a treat. Um, I mean, first and foremost, the, the inspiration, the wow, like, oh, I have this great idea, this excitement, this newness, this freshness, this lightness, this spark, the fire in the belly. Um, the I can't go to sleep because this thought is just trying to make its way out or you wake up at three o'clock in the morning with a, with this new idea and you can't get back to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, that anticipation of actually diving in. That's what I and I, I notice that in me when I give myself the sacred space to open myself up for new things and inspiration and um, and sometimes it, it comes, you know, when you're in the shower, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're walking down the street, <laughs> when you're riding the subway and and especially when you're riding the subway, you know, everybody has those blank masked faces <laughs> on and then you get this genius idea and you, you know, it just bursts out of your face and you might even go woohoo. And, and then, you know, you realize, <laughs> oh, geez, OK, I got to <laughs> um, I got to contain myself until at least I get out of the subway car. Um so I would just say excitement and and a spark. Mm -hmm. I say the spark of creation. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely, definitely a spark, um, an emotional spark. However, you you define that. Um, yeah. When like joy, when we're there's in a joy. Joy. It sounds very joy. joyous. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then when you know the second part of of the greater process, the failure, the mistakes. That is, it can be as light and easy as minor discomfort <laughs> to painstaking eye stabbing frustration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. uh, just the frustration of those failures of, of being so excited about your creation, but you know, having to invest three months to make it happen and you want it done within three days, you know, and just being like, Ugh, uh -huh. I just want to get it done. Uh -huh. um, and then with the with the sharing your talent with the world, something that comes up for me every single time and every single time I experience it, I'm always like, what is wrong with me? And then I then when I actually ask myself that or, or I just look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're launching a product. Oh, yeah, you're you're sharing your talent with the world. And that that emotion, that feeling is vulnerability because mm -hmm. you're bearing your soul to to the world, you know, and uh, that fear, that vulnerability, that that sheer raw, I'm going to take a step forward and I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. Doubt. Um, blind faith. And. And I just I just re remember, you know, just every single time I do a launch, every single time I bring something out into the world, every single time I get up on stage and, and do a, um, a performance or a moderation or whatever, um, every time I, I, I create something, that last part feels so vulnerable. But on the outside, everyone's like, congratulations, you did it. You should feel great. Mm -hmm. And you're like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, you realize it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And and the more things that you put out into the world, the more you, you realize it's just part of the process. And and that's to be expected. And then I think after the after the initial sharing your talent with the world, the relief, the the uh, OK, 
I did it. Good, bad, ugly. It it happened. It wasn't perfect. It'll never be perfect. But I did the best that I could with what I had. Right. And I learned a lot from it. So um, those are the those are the feelings that I experience when whenever I go through uh, a creative process of my own. If, if I were to use the terminology that I, I would use with a, a technique like album moding, it sounds like we go with joy and then we go with the frustration. We would sort of connect that with with elements of the anger, you know, mm. and then you have the, the, the fear definitely is in there and the exposure that you feel that vulnerability you mentioned. And then we would, you know, bring that down to a sense of uh, tenderness, which is, is, is not it's not a neutral emotion by any chance. It's just feeling at peace, you know. Yeah. Uh, when you feel I like tenderness, that. yeah. So, and and it's and it's a human trait. Everybody goes through that in in some form or another. Maybe not always as dramatic or as dynamic, but I would think that is a common human um, experience that we have in the Most creative definitely. process. Yeah, and it's and it's those feelings in there. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit then about uh, about failure. Um, mm. Why do you think it's so important for us, first of all, to experience failure? I think it's important to experience failure because, you know, we the day that we were born, we couldn't we couldn't walk the first day that we were born. So why do we expect that we should have this or that or achieve this or that or make this creation immediately and not fail. It's it's due to in part just being human, I think. Um, but also now with social media and everything is just so fast, we have lost any aspect and concept of patience. Hmm. And I think we're so used to getting what we want yesterday that when we don't get what we want, especially when it's something that we're trying to bring to life ourselves, where we come up against failure and a lot of people don't know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I think failure is so important in the whole process, but nobody talks about it. If they do, they, they, they're crying into their pillow or they're getting drunk or they're numbing themselves or they're only speaking about it to, you know, maybe one special person. But through my years of teaching creative people about, you know, branding and marketing and putting themselves out there. You know, I have, I have all these courses and, and things that, that I teach them on, on how to market themselves and brand themselves and you can do it. You got this. But the thing that always comes back is the resistance and the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, there's this, no matter what I'm talking about, whether it be building your own website, whether it be marketing yourself on social media or sending out direct email cover letters to dream clients or dream agencies. Whatever I'm talking about, people keep saying, oh, I'm just so scared of failing or, or it's tied somehow to making a mistake or, or being a failure. And I just saw I just saw a pattern and I was like and, and I kept, you know, repeating myself over and over, you know, my idea of what failure is. And I thought maybe there's something here that needs to be explored. Um, especially with creative people and especially with failure. That's very interesting because, you know, here you are offering them the opportunity almost not to fail. Mm. <laughs> and yet the resistance is still there. You know, maybe it's a lack of, of trust of self or, or whatever it is, or maybe they're afraid to find out what they both know and don't know. You know, mm -hmm. that could be a little bit of that, too. It's a little bit of it's vulnerability when you have to stop and write down and talk about yourself uh, in any context, I think. Yeah. And um, but here you are. You're, you're like the cheerleader. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it. You know, but I'm scared. I don't know. But no, no, you can do it. Yeah. It, it's almost like being a life coach. I mean, yeah. that, that's how that's how they kind of make their living is understanding some people really do need that extra encouragement that, yeah. because they can't find it within themselves mm. or it may be in the environment that they're raised in. Exactly. You know, they don't live in a place that encourages things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. And so it's important for us then to embrace failure then, correct? Most definitely. It's the hardest thing to do, but if, but you have to do it, you know, it's, it's one of those, those 
catch 22s, you know, it's the hardest thing to do, but you have to do it in order to move forward. Otherwise you get, you feel stuck and then you feel more like a failure. It, it's, yeah. And it's not just the creativity side. We're kind of talking about creatives in that process, but failure comes in, in all shapes and forms. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, just, <laughs> this just came out of my, just came into my head and I wanted to share it with you. What's that? <laughs> I'm having a revelation right now. Um, so I, uh, I cannot cook for the life of me. Right? No, no, you're I kidding me. I right? cannot cook. I mean, you, you I mean I can you can't cook, cook? For myself. I can, I can, <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I, I don't bring people over to to cook for them, right? I, I wish I could. Right? You you make them come over and bring food to you, right? Like yeah, well, like well, a we potluck. We go to dinner, you know. It's 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 easy. It's fun, but um, <laughs> or the or people will come over to the house and and we'll have a drink and then we'll go to dinner. But rarely do <laughs> rarely do I cook. Um, and and what's so funny and and what just what what just came up in my head right now, just speaking speaking about this, is that for decades decades i i had this thing in my head of you're such a failure at cooking mm. right you you just you are such a bad cook right <laughs> you can't cook you suck at cooking you <laughs> and and i don't suck at cooking i don't i'm not a failure at cooking i mean i'm i'm 40 years old i've been feeding myself for <laughs> A, a, a good long time. Like, I, I think I got the, at least the basics down, right? Um, and just recently, I just, I forgave myself and I said, you know what? You're not a failure at cooking. You just don't like to cook. Ah. And that's just part of who I am, right? And, and you know, I, I, do, I do enjoy cooking like the basics, like a good chicken, uh, chicken breast with a bit of rice or some, some spinach and some grilled grilled veggies like that's really good and healthy and and it's easy to make i'm not one of those people that that you know loves the different spices and that I, I just like a good healthy meal and i'm and i'm good you know but i also enjoy so i might not be great at cooking but i love tasting other people's food i love tasting other going to red to different restaurants and, and trying out different foods so i might not be a foodie that cooks but I definitely discovered the foodie in me that that loves different tastes and 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 things like that, and appreciating the the love and attention that other people put into into their cooking. So that's a great way to look at failure as 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 another perspective of yourself, and mm. probably even as in a way to save you time because here you know you're not good at cooking now you could have went to a cooking class you know to improve you could be watching those uh you know television shows about how to improve get all the cookbooks mm -hmm. in the world but you still wouldn't be a good cook because you simply discovered and admitted you don't like to cook and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that so perhaps then what people are afraid of is not just the failure but the realization that this is not for them yeah. Yeah. It's it's almost it's almost like they're romanticizing it when mm -hmm. really if they just took the took the two minutes to say, like, do I even like this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and say, OK, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe maybe something else is, is for me. And that's not a failure. That's that's just more self-discovery. Awesome. Let, where where will this take me now? You yeah. Know? And where will you flourish? Exactly. You know, so uh, that's interesting. Um, I had a student one time who swore she wanted to be an, an actress, and I thought, mm. great. And she never auditioned for anything. Mm. And and I would always ask her. I say, well, you know, these uh, we've got auditions coming up. Wouldn't you try? Uh, okay, but she would never come. And in the back of my mind, I kept thinking how can you call yourself a performer and never try? But maybe it's this mm -hmm. whole idea of it's that fantasy aspect in my mm. mind and in my heart, I want to be performer, but maybe I really know I can't be. Mm. And so if I try and I don't get it and I fail, then it might tell me no, and I don't want that to happen. So, yeah. I mean, some people could just stay with it regardless. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, it re that reminds me of the, when I moved to New York City at the ripe old age of 21, thinking, you know, within a month's time, I'll be, you know, in a leading role on Broadway. Um, that, uh, I, I had some friends that graduated a year before me from from college that moved to New York City, 
and they and they gave me an awesome bit of advice and they said rejections going to be your middle name mm. um so get used to it don't take it personally and um don't fall into the trap of doing the thing of when somebody asks you, so what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm an actor. And then they say, so you're a waiter. <laughs> <laughs> a waiter that never auditions, right? And and I was like, well, what do you mean? They said, just, just keep your eyes out and just observe how many people say that they're an actor and they haven't auditioned for five years. Mm but they've been waiting tables for five years, you know? So mm. it's, it's that thing of romanticizing the, the concept of, of what it is, but not actually leaning into the vulnerability, sharing your talent with the world and, and going to those auditions, even if you don't get cast, it's all about just showing up and being seen and being heard. Yeah, and with each, and with each <clears throat> tryout, you learn something a little bit new. Exactly. Uh, maybe it's not what it's what not to do next time, and that's still yeah. just as valuable as learning, you know, what to do. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me ask you this: Have you known anyone? Uh, can you share a particular story with us where somebody was 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 truly failing? At pursuing something, but we're you know we're still being sort of persistent through that, and maybe became a, re a really remarkable success, you know, in in your business. That <laughs> yes, wow. Um, so I was um, assistant, uh, I was associate assistant choreographer to the uh, musical production Mamma Mia, the ABBA musical, over here in Europe, and uh, there was this one kid, David. And he had not an awesome audition. He was he was he was that Mamma Mia type, right? He had that that vibe. He was perfect, right? His audition was great. His dance technique wasn't awesome, but he had this this energy. That's something about him, right? Mm -hmm. So we cast him in, you know, one of the lead dancers, and I said, "Oh, I'll work with him. I'll I'll I'll, I'll make it happen." And Every single week we would have a note session on Thursday and every single week I would give the entire cast notes and then I would say, David, stay for an extra half an hour. And <laughs> I worked tirelessly with this kid and bless his heart because he wanted, I mean, he got the gig, right? So that's a validation in and of itself, but he just wasn't nailing it to the, to the degree that I was like, oh, I, I'd see you doing something, but but you're just not hitting it yet. And he was a, he, I mean, he has a break dance. He, he was a break dancer, right? He wasn't a trained dancer. So he had, he had the spark. He just didn't have the technique. Mm. And I was just trying to give him that technique. But what he also had was this amazing singing voice. And he had this amazing presence and he looked like a movie star. So, so you, you just couldn't, you couldn't not love the kid. Even when he was having a bad day, he was still like, you just wanted to pinch his cheek, right? <laughs> so, so, and, and it, it was it was really cute. We were like, oh, David, you know, come stay with me afterwards. We're gonna work on, you know, this dance number or whatever. So, um, so in one aspect, he was the lead, quote unquote, the lead male dancer in, in Mamma Mia, but success. But in in the other aspect, it looked like I was picking on him every week. So failure, right? Right. Um, so, so the show ends and he's from Sweden. So he, he goes back to Sweden and I hear all these different things. David is doing Mamma Mia in Sweden. Oh, good for him. Good for him. Yeah. But he's not doing the dancer role. He's doing, um, one of the smaller lead roles. I'm like, Oh, that makes sense. He's got a good, good voice. He looks great. He fits that, that role really well. Good for him. Oh, he left my, uh, six weeks later. He left Mamma Mia. Oh, geez, what happened? It didn't work out. Uh, no, he got like the um, the lead in High School Musical, the 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 Swedish version on, live on stage, like mm. the one that Zac Efron did. Yes, the role. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. like, I was like, he got the Zac Efron part in <laughs> Swedish. They're like, yeah, that's him. I'm like, wow, okay. Six months later, he left that because he went off to do another lead role in another big musical. Oh. He left that, to, so he just had this huge career he's now a pop star in in sweden ah yeah so he has this like amazing career <laughs> right <laughs> because he has all these different talents but he just didn't know 
where to where to place it all. And he and he, you know, he wasn't the best dancer, but he had this amazing presence. And through his our weekly sessions together, working together, um, I was able to help him hone his skills on his dancing and, and his presentation so he can really be of star quality for, for the Swedish production. So that is one example of working with somebody that um, that just wasn't hitting it, but was born to do something else entirely. He wasn't born to be in the ensemble. He was born to be a lead. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and he st- it, it, and he sings uh, pop songs. He's a pop singer. Yeah, he's a he's a big old pop star now. He he was on um, I think he's on like like the Swedish Idol or some, he's some big pop sensation now. Like he's he's huge. Yeah, well, he's you huge. need to get a press pass. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> David, remember yeah. me? David, do you remember <laughs> me? You know? <laughs> I would definitely be looking into that. Uh, we have a we have a listener from Chicago, Kelsey, mm-hmm. who's uh, sent me in an, an email with a question. So let's go see what she uh, has to ask for you. Sure Let thing. me see. Um, she said that she has always wanted to be an actress, and she lives in Chicago. So, and she has been trying to pursue a career in acting for the past three years, but hasn't had much luck. She feels like a failure. She wants to know, and this is right where we're talking here, she wants to know if failure is a signal that maybe she needs to quit pursuing her dream and look at some other kind of path. This is tricky. This is tricky. Yeah, this is this is a really intricate question. I mean, when you're auditioning, um, I, I know it just as, just as well. You know, when you're auditioning, you're bearing your soul in front of strangers that are gawking at you. They've heard... 30 other people before you, you're wondering what's what's special about you that's going to stand out, that's going to book you the gig, um, especially in a big, big city like Chicago or New York or L.A. or London or Berlin, where there's so much talent and so few roles and you're auditioning and auditioning. And, and there, so you're not an actor, but you're really a waiter. You're actually somebody pounding the pavement every single day. Um, what comes what comes to mind is um, is two things. Number one, um, Elizabeth Gilbert, the author that wrote Eat, Pray, Love, her latest book, uh, Big Magic, which came out, I think, a year or two ago. um, She said when she was starting out as a writer, she would go to her temp job or whatever nine to five job that she had and make sure that she could pay the bills and make sure that her person herself was, you know, taken care of. And then she'd come home, have dinner. And then really start work, open up her laptop, sit at her kitchen table and just write and write and write for hours on end until one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Save it, close the laptop, go to bed, get back up, go to work. So she has a roof over her head and at five o'clock, come back home, have dinner and then really go to work. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the if you can separate yourself and your inner artist, right, your inner artist just wants to be artistic, right? Your Mm. inner artist, for example, Elizabeth Gilbert just wants to write. So she gave her inner artist, the sacred space at her kitchen table, the chance to write. But she was also realistic in the sense of she herself had to take care of the inner artist and make sure that there was food on the table and a roof over her head. Wanting to become an actor or being an actor and auditioning three years in a row and not getting anywhere. I mean, that that's not news, mm. right? That's that's unfortunately more common than it is uncommon. Um, but I think it's the thing of persistence, grit, always um, asking yourself, what can I learn from this? Asking for feedback after an audition, going to getting good training, but also knowing when the training's enough or when it's time to switch from, you know, one style of acting training to another style of acting or maybe focus on your singing or or whatever there's so many different especially with technology there's so many different projects out there whether it be stage film voiceover that you can act in right and i think it's just a thing of staying curious and putting your feelers out and seeing okay where will today take me let's try something new and always making sure that you're taking care of your inner artist. The second thing that I wanted to say is, you know, Orange is the New Black, the character Crazy Eyes? She said in an interview, she said a week before her Orange is the New Black audition, she said, I'm going to do one more audition. And 
And if I don't get it, I'm going to hang up my shoes and go do something completely different. Mm. And that last edition was for Orange is the New Black, where she won, an, I think, an Emmy or all these different awards became this overnight sensation. And um, I think there's a there's a thing of understanding how you deal with failure. I think there's a thing of understanding that you need to take care of your inner artist and your inner artist. It, it's like a cat. Your inner artist is, is just what it is, right? It's not your inner artist's job to pay the rent. That's your job mm. to pay the rent for your inner artist and to constantly put yourself out there and not take it as personally as it sometimes gets. But believe me, I mean, I've had nights in New York City after five auditions on a Friday and I had the whole weekend and I just bawled my eyes out, mm. you know, mm -hmm. you pick yourself back up and you keep on going, you know. Um, so, yeah. That it, it's, it is a tricky question, but that's um, that's my two cents. <laughs> well, that's really good. And, and I love the analogy of uh, that the creativity is is almost like this child that we have to nurture. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we might have to go to work and, and, you know, and clean the house or do other things while we're still nurturing this child. They're always there. They're always, you know, present. Uh, and you have, yeah. to, you have to pay attention to them. But that doesn't mean that uh, because you're not doing, you know, your thing that you're that you're a failure. But here, here's a question that, that kind of comes out of this. You know, people like to put years, they like to put a time frame. Yeah. In, in, in your viewpoint, in terms of failure, is there any kind of recommendation i mean sometimes mm. like even with voiceover for example people mm -hmm. say well it, it'll take so many years for you to make your money back you know if you're not making anything in five years you should look for another job people like to put time limits on things do you think there is a, a real time limit to embracing your failure i mean if you've been <laughs> failing for five years do you think it's yeah. time to embrace i mean what do you think yeah, i get what you mean it's so funny. You, um, I get asked this a lot when I talk about failure. Um, what's the time frame, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is what I always say. You can have a goal and you can be totally into it. And then after three times failing, you go, God, no, it just does not feel right. Or you can have the same goal fail 3,000 times or 3 million times and pick yourself up and go, that was fun, <laughs> <laughs> right? I think, <sighs> and I don't want to fantasize it and I don't want to romanticize it. The rent needs to be paid, right? Um, but I think you have, it, it, it's so individual. I don't think it's fair for other people to put a time frame on somebody else's success based off of their success. I just don't, don't see the, point in that. I think I think it's the thing of if you work tirelessly at it and continue to improve and look for the jobs that suit you best, you know, I'm you can hear from my voice, I sound much younger than I am. Um and I do voiceover, but I don't get booked for the big booming movie trailer voice because that's just not me. And I sometimes I do get booked for that. I'm like, guys, are you sure I cannot do this? <laughs> I, I have tons of other people that I know that can knock it out of the park in one take. Right. No, you'll be fine. You got it. And then like an hour later, they're listening into the session. They're like, man, we're just not hitting it. I'm like, exactly. Right. Because <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> right. So I think the more that you know what you're capable of and what you're not capable of, um, that's more of, of a measurement value than saying, you know, invest X amount of years. And if you're not making any money, then on this date, stop. Mm -hmm. Because who knows the next day, the, the day after that date could be the day that you get the gig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's really no formula here. It, it, no, really not is, at all. Uh, it really is a personal journey that you have to take. We all cross the same thresholds, but we all cross them, you know, differently. Yeah. Um, so tell us, uh, what are you working on right now? <laughs> Funny that you should ask. Um, <laughs> I am just finishing up um, my book on failure called Embrace the F Word Failure. Um, ah. And it has been um, a sort of fun little project that <laughs> came out of actually failure. Mm. <laughs> um, 
it started the whole the, the crux of it all the the seed of of this entire book came from when I was being Skype interviewed for a um, a conference where they had asked me to speak um, at their conference, but they weren't too sure what the topic was and where I would fit into the whole speakers panel. And I said, you know, I have my talk, my TEDx talk, what creativity is trying to tell you. And usually that, you know, that that's a great thing. And they go, yeah, but maybe something else. And then I said, okay, well, what about this? And they're like, yeah, what else do you got? maybe this. And I, so I listed everything that I had. And then they kept saying, what else do you got? And out of the blue, I said, well, I also had this talk about failure. And they were like, Ooh, tell me more. So I'm about, I'm talking out of my ass and I have no clue where this is going, <laughs> but I was basing it off of, um, the, the failure part of my, of my talk of, uh, what creativity is trying to tell you. And I said, um, like I said, in, in this interview, you know, there's a lot of people out there that aren't talking about failure that are experiencing failure and just don't know how to deal with it. So what if we made it interactive and brought people up on stage and we failed in a safe space and realized, you know, there's nothing really to be that scared about. And they were like, we love it. Let's do it. So um, I had two months to create a talk on failure, two months to do tons of research. And um, and then I did the talk and it was a success. And then I was like, oh, okay, great. And I put that into my portfolio of, of talks that I do. And all the, all the conferences that I spoke at in 2015, they wanted that talk. And it wasn't just for creatives. It was for lawnmower makers. It was oh. for social media marketers. It was like all these different conferences. They wanted to hear the talk about failure. So I'm like, you, okay, you maybe were I'm onto something. Wait a minute. Were you really invited to a, a lawnmowers convention? Yes. <laughs> Okay. They had it was it was hilarious. They had they had they flew them in from all over the world. These lawn mower maker engineers wow. of this one company to talk about you know how we can be innovative for the for the next next years and and everything. And here's Jonathan to talk about failure and that we should <laughs> and we should be be open to embracing failure. I was like, all right, that is pretty if, wild. I love it. it. It was I must admit it was the driest. Uh, audience I've ever had like you could hear a pin drop and I'm quirky and and wild and crazy guy and they were just so they were dry as bread it was it was it was um yeah it was a, it was a, it was an, ex, an an exercise in in knowing that uh, you're not at the right place at the right time but still you're going to follow through with it anyway I love it I love it so keep telling us about this journey then to the to the book <laughs> <laughs> so um, at one of these conferences, um, not the lawnmower conference, um, but at one of the conferences, they recorded the audio and they sent it to all of the participants and they sent it also to to me. I was like, oh, this was th oh, what a nice gift. And I was listening to the to the audio and I was like, oh, this would be really interesting if I just transcribed it and to see if, you know, my my speaking the way that I speak is also the way that I write. It was just a just curiosity to see the similarities because I know a lot of people write very differently to the way that they speak, and I just wanted to check. It's just a little self self check. So I I um, asked one of my my assistant at the time. I said, "Can you just transcribe this? Just write it out, and so I can read it." She's like, "Yeah, all right, cool." So she wrote it out, and I was reading it, and then I started to edit it, you know, take out all the ums and, and make the sentences flow. And then I said, well, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm, if I'm reading this, you know, then I, I should have like a little exercise there, maybe or like a little workbook and, but it jumps in, there's a big jump over here. So maybe there's like two chapters that need to be written in order to bridge that gap. And I'm like, but I'm not writing a book. So of course <laughs> on the weekends I'm in the office writing a book, and then <laughs> And and I know from personal experience, because this isn't my first book, that's how I write books. You know, I, I'm like, I'm not writing a book, but I'm spending my whole weekend um, in the office behind my computer. And so I'm like, OK, maybe I'm writing a book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it just turned into a book and I shared it with all of my uh, close friends and the people that that um, that I respect and and my editor and. And I said, I think I created something here and uh, I want you to read it. Now <laughs> and give, us, came back. give us one more time the title of the book. Yes. The title of the book is called Embrace the F Word Failure. Mm. 
and um and yeah so so it just naturally happened and then i sat on it for a good year and then uh, out of out of fear of vulnerability and then i leaned into the vulnerability and said it's just got to be put into the world so it is going to be put into the world in the fall of uh 2017 what's what's your fear with this one what's your sense of fa- failure fear of failure with this one um it's n- it's not a fear of fear of failure it's just the it's the vulnerability mm. i think um i know my 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 process so well um i for example this interview i could i could talk for days i could get up on stage and you know, talk for days about my own stuff, uh, presenting or moderating uh, a company. Like I, I can do it in my sleep. Uh, I can go go to a karaoke bar and <laughs> rock out uh, all my my twenty different songs that I, that I got prepped and ready to go for karaoke, depending upon the <laughs> evening. Like it's, it like I have no problem with that, right? With with getting up on stage and, and performing or, or speaking or talking or whatever, get into doing a video for, for people like so, so easy. Writing is for me the most vulnerable thing ever. Mm. It is so vulnerable. And maybe because my mom's an English teacher. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that might be rooted in that. Yes. It might be. But, um, but I just, I, because of what I want to put out there in the world, um, I want it, to feel right and I want it to feel like the right timing and it it felt right last year and the year before it felt right but it just didn't feel like the right timing now it really feels like the right timing so um so yes my book embrace the f word um failure is going to be shared with the world and out into the world and I cannot wait to share it and uh, and help other people deal with their own failure and realize that it's actually not that bad. Uh, will you be offering it on your website at some point? Yes, I will be. Um, the website to get a to download a free chapter or two is embracethefword.com. And is that also where we can find out more information about you and and the uh, uh, you can, your business? You can find more information about me at jonathantilly.com. J o n a t h a n t i l l e y dot com. Well, perfect. I think your your book is very well timed. You know, just thinking about our world and uh, all the things that are happening, and um, you know, the the generations that are coming forward from participation awards that they're given. You know, just for showing up mm. at T ball. You're right. <laughs> you know, this idea of embracing failure is actually a pretty serious thing. Mm. Um, you know, we're talking about it because we're used to it. But I'm talking I'm thinking here about that next generation that yeah. is, is, is known to not always have a good grasp or embrace it and, exactly. and see that as just a natural process and not to, you know, get depressed or do something mm. because of that. Yeah. Oh, so wonderful to have you today. This is great. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it so very much. And with that, I thank you for joining me, your host, Monique, on the Emotions Matter podcast.